knows that the mind is a fiction and devoid of anything real, knows that his own mind neither exists nor doesn't exist. Mortals keep creating the mind, claiming it exists. And arhats keep negating the mind, claiming it doesn't exist. But bodhisattvas and buddhas neither create nor negate the mind. This is what's meant by the mind that neither exists nor doesn't exist. The mind that neither exists nor doesn't exist is called the middle way. It's a picture perfect definition of Buddha's middle path. There are those who don't understand the middle path one bit. There are those who think that they understand the middle path, but they don't. Even the ones who are practicing the middle path, it could sometimes even be a disciple or a Buddhist monk ordained in Buddhist traditions, given clear instructions on the ways of the Buddha, fully educated on the understanding of the Eightfold Path, who can actually talk about the middle way with perfect clarity and understanding. But when it comes to actually knowing what the middle path is, actually being on the middle path, more often than not, they completely miss it. Zen is the middle path. If you do not understand Zen, you cannot understand Buddha's middle path. Middle path is not about avoiding extremes. It is only in words, it is in description. As an idea, it is the practice of avoiding extremes. But practically, how do you do it? How can you avoid the extremes when you are still choosing one over the other? The middle path can be practiced only when you have transcended choice. When you accept both the extremes with equanimity, you accept everything that is happening just the way they are happening. That is Buddha's true middle path. Because otherwise, how can there be any benefit to staying on the middle path? Let's say you don't want to be greedy. You don't want to run after wealth, security in material comforts. You want to follow Buddha's middle path. Now, what does that actually mean? Does it mean that you consciously reject opulence? You consciously reject money? You consciously reject a materialistic way of life? Now, if you're consciously rejecting, that means you are choosing. When you are choosing, your action is bound to your mind. It is bound to your thoughts. It's bound to your ego. Because you are choosing it, you have to continue to choose. If you choose one set of activities, then you have to choose another as well. The moment the idea of choosing comes in, there is no liberation. There is no detachment from action. 
the action is performed in exactly the same way with slightly different thought process. The conversation that is happening in your mind is slightly different. But you are still having the conversation. In choosing the middle path, in trying to avoid the extremes, you are still thinking about the extremes. Otherwise, how can you choose? Zen is above and beyond all this. In Zen, you don't choose. You don't try to be on the middle path. You don't avoid the extremes. All these things should happen as a natural consequence of how you live. And if your path of life leads you to wealth, accept it. If your path of life leads you to poverty, accept it. If your path of life leads you to pleasure, accept it. If it leads you to pain, accept it. Middle path is about separating between the action that is being performed by the mind and the body and the one who is simply observing all this. You have to become the observer. You have to become the watcher. You have to detach yourself from all doing, including choosing to be on the middle path. That is why if you even think that you understand Buddha's teachings, you are following Buddha's teachings, there will come a point in time in your journey where you will see that Buddha and his teachings are actually an obstacle. You have to even transcend Buddha's teaching and Buddha himself. That is why it is said that when you meet the Buddha on the way, kill the Buddha. It is only Zen that can say that. Zen says, kill the Buddha. You cannot be in the state of Zen unless you kill the Buddha. Because he is noise. He is words, ideas, disturbance that is stuck in your mind. Far from worshipping him, far from revering him, far from performing all kinds of rituals to please him, to connect with him, you forget all about him. See that you are the Buddha. Just imagine hearing these words during the 5th century while the society around you is seeped in Buddhist ideology, Buddhist philosophy. And here, a Zen master has the audacity to say, drop the Buddha. If you find him on the way, kill him. Zen masters are very different in their approach to teaching. They don't beat around the bush and they have no intention of being nice, being polite. There are such stories of Zen masters, Zen masters beating their students. There are particular schools of thought where Zen masters walk around carrying a stick. And if they see a student is not in the state of Zen or if he's falling asleep or he's asking a totally stupid question, he beats them with the stick. And there are stories that are told about how that one sudden blow from the stick of the enlightened master has awakened the student from his sleep. And some enlightened masters are very rude when they say certain things. It's because they have no intention of trying to satisfy your mind. There is a reason why Bodhidharma only had two disciples and why he's depicted as a fierce, blue-eyed barbarian. Why he doesn't look like a gentle, approachable teacher in the imagery. 
when you look at his paintings, you can tell that there's no way a real man could have been this scary. Even if he had slightly bulging eyes, this is an absolute over-exaggeration. Show him without eyelids, show him without a smile, with, with a growl, with a grimace. Why? Somewhere, that would have been his reputation. Bodhidharma must have been very straight and sometimes very rude because he can see the obstacles that you are unable to see. He can see how your mind has been hijacked by the world around you by talking to you in such a way that it keeps on putting you in an environment where you feel justified to hold on to that false sense of you. The compliments that you receive, the way you are treated, If you think about it, as far as the Zen master is concerned, you are the problem. You have to disappear. Your ego has to disappear. Your mind has to disappear. Now, why would he treat you with respect? Why would he massage your ego? If the teaching has to be direct, the method also has to be direct. Either your mind clings to things or it clings by trying to get rid of things. Both are clinging. That is why one Zen master says, it is easy to walk without leaving footprints, but it's hard to walk without touching the ground. Zen is to walk without touching the ground. It is the most delicate of art forms. It is so subtle, so beautiful, so filled with intelligence, awareness and the actual fragrance of life that your mind is totally useless here. So much so that not a single thought about Zen will be useful to be in Zen. The entire approach to Zen is slowly forgetting everything you know about Zen. 